I'd like to start with two points. One, about 15 years ago, a new approach to biology commenced called systems biology. It's global and holistic. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But that systems biology approach has absolutely transformed medicine, giving us systems medicine and this thing we call uh, P4 medicine. Considering P4 medicine, we've come to realize that something we've called scientific wellness is going to be in the future a fundamental part of the healthcare system, and it's a, a fundamental approach to dealing with the whole process of aging. And I think what's remarkable about uh, scientific wellness is the idea that it will not only transform our personal health, but it will let us understand disease in ways we never could have conceived even a few years ago. So when I started at uh, Caltech in 1970 as an assistant professor, it was clear to me that biology was enormously uh, complex, as, as was disease at that time. It was also clear that we didn't begin to have the tools to deal with this complexity. And interestingly enough, we didn't have even a conceptual way of describing the complexity in that that later came to be called uh, systems biology. And in fact, it reminded me at the time very much of the famous parable of the elephant and the six blind men, each feeling a different part of the elephant and declaring it's a spear or it's a stump or it's a fan. And that was very much what biology was at that time. People tended to look at one gene or one protein or one very simple system and, and not to see the biological system in the context of the whole that it was. And I was really intrigued with the idea to handle biological complexity. We needed to develop new technologies so we could create data to explore new dimensions of data space in, in uh, living organisms and so forth. And in fact, I remember in 1973 reading this uh, book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, which talked about paradigm changes in physics. It made the really fascinating point, one, that paradigm changes are really difficult to initiate because they require that you think outside the box. And most of us never learn to think outside the box. It's really an important attribute to uh, aspire to. And number two, he made the point that even if you do succeed in thinking out of the box and creating a paradigm change, getting the community of scientists to accept it is even more difficult because most scientists are terribly conservative and they're very reluctant to give up what they learned earlier in their career. And I certainly found this to be true as I, over the course of my career, have participated in, in what I would call six uh, paradigm changes. And you've heard about the first one, that is, at Caltech, we developed four instruments that basically allowed one to read and to write DNA, and later we developed several others that I'll uh, I'll talk about it later point in time. What these instruments did that was really transformational for this whole issue of uh, complexity was they allowed us for the first time to think about making high throughput measurements in biology, getting lots and lots of data. And of course, that eventually led to big data and analytics, a central theme in biology today. One of the instruments that we developed, the automated DNA sequencer, was what made possible the Human Genome Project, and in fact got me invited to the first uh, meeting ever held on the Human Genome Project in the spring of 1985, where 12 scientists were invited to come and, and uh, consider this possibility. And we came to two striking conclusions. One, uh, that it was feasible, although technically extremely difficult at that time. Uh, 
But more interesting was the idea that the 12 of us that came there, supposedly sympathetic for the idea, were split six to six on whether it was a good idea. And those against it were fanatically against it because they saw it as the intrusion of big biology and the demise of small biology. And of course, the irony of that is uh, the Human Genome Project, the first real big science project in biology, utterly transformed virtually every aspect of human biology. And it's absolutely facilitated beautifully uh, small science, looking at things uh, in, in much more detail and so forth. But for me, the essence of solving the human genome sequence was, of course, for the first time one could think about doing proper systems biology because you had uh, the knowledge of almost all the genes, and by inference, uh, all of the proteins. Now, the automated sequencer to build really required the integration of engineering, of chemistry, of computer science, and of biology. And it was during that period of time that I realized that in the future, biology was going to be facing really hard problems, and it needed to live in a cross-disciplinary environment where the leading-edge biology could drive the development of relevant new technologies, and they, in turn, could create uh, the analytic tools you needed to handle the data. And this cross-disciplinary vision I proposed at Caltech in the late 80s, the biologists utterly opposed it. And I'll leave it to you to think why they might oppose it, but Bill Gates made it possible to go to the University of Washington and start the first cross-disciplinary department in 1992. And it thrived there for eight years. We invented the first major techniques in the newly emerging field of proteomics. We developed the software that fueled the whole genome project. I developed there the inkjet technology that allowed one to synthesize DNA arrays and enormous amounts of DNA. And on and on, this department was enormously successful, but unfortunately, the dean who hired me and promised me yet another floor after four years to create a systems biology institute died in the Himalayas in an avalanche. And the new dean came in with a totally different agenda. So after a few years in 2000, I resigned to start the uh, Institute of Systems Biology, uh, a nonprofit research institute that was dedicated, the first such institute, to essentially developing system science in its application, uh, both to biology and medicine. And that quickly led to these concepts we've already talked about of systems medicine and P4 medicine. We'll talk about those in considerably more detail. And I would say, in many ways, the final interesting paradigm change has occurred just in the past year when our institute affiliated with the U.S. third largest healthcare system to be able to bring the wonders of systems medicine directly to the patient's bedside. And what I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about these last three paradigm changes. First, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the Institute of Systems Biology now uh, with nine professors and a $35 million uh, uh, dollar a, a year budget and everything. But what the essence of systems biology is can best be uh, uh, discussed in terms of this uh, Rube Goldberg cartoon. So in this cartoon, Rube Goldberg has put together 14 devices that, when appropriately connected, allow him to cool his soup. And the question is, what would you do if you wanted to take a systems approach to understanding that relatively complex gadget? And of course, the idea is, one, you'd want to define all the parts in the system. That's what the Genome Project did for us. Two, you'd like to understand what the individual parts did. Three, you want to know how the parts are connected one to another. 
Four, you'd like to know the dynamics of the device and how it, it, it moves with regard to cooling the soup. And then five, you could begin to formulate hypotheses about how it carries out its soup cooling activity. And then six, and this is the critical part people often forget in systems biology. Systems biology isn't fundamentally computational. It's fundamentally biological. So the ultimate objective is to perturb the system and formally prove that your hypotheses uh, are actually correct. And that's really the essence of systems biology. Only, of course, living organisms are infinitely more complicated uh, molecular machines in this regard. Moving to the, the fifth paradigm change, of course, systems medicine and, and this so-called P4 medicine, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. What I would say is systems thinking has provided two fundamental opportunities uh, with regard to medicine. So number one is the idea that humans, like elephants or complicated organisms, so we need to be able to generate an enormous amount of data for each individual to really understand what they're about. And we call this generation of data dense, dynamic, personal data clouds. And in the future, each one of you will have literally billions of data points that come from many different uh, types of measurements and analyses. And the fundamental idea is that we are now learning how to integrate and model this data so for each individual we can identify actionable possibilities that will either increase your wellness or let you avoid disease. And we'll give you uh, specific examples of this uh, in a few minutes and everything. I think a really important part about this uh, uh, whole endeavor is this uh, study, which we started in 2014, I'll, I'll talk to you about that in just a moment, really was the first example of what precision medicine should be. Precision medicine isn't just about genome sequences and about clinical records. It is about making all of the other vital measurements that let you reconcile how your genetics and your environment come together to provide you with your health at that particular point in time. And that's what these dense, dynamic, personal data clouds do. And we'll talk in a little bit of, uh, in a few minutes, about what that's all about. So the first thing is generating these data clouds that are absolutely critical to understanding human biology and human medicine. The second thing that systems biology has brought to uh, systems medicine is the idea of uh, biological networks. These are the interactions of molecules and systems. They can occur at the level of the genome, at the level of molecules, at the level of cells, at the level of organs, or even they can occur at the level of organisms where you have uh, social networks and the like. These are all seamlessly integrated together to, under normal conditions, uh, mediate uh, development, physiologic responses, and aging. And of course, if these networks become disease perturbed, they cause disease. So understanding how that disease perturbed network differs from its normal counterpart is the key to understanding the pathophysiology of disease. And it's critical to, be, uh, to being able to develop early diagnostics and therapeutic approaches uh, toward disease and everything. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about one experimental system uh, that we've studied for the last uh, 10 or 12 years in enormous detail because it is a beautiful example of what systems thinking is going to be doing for humans in the future. And this is a form of neurodegeneration in mice that's caused by injecting into their brains uh, activated uh, prion particles. And these pre activated prion particles 
causing neurodegeneration that in mice generally takes of the order of 22 weeks. And what we did with these mice was to sample uh, different individuals at different uh, time points along the 22-week period by analyzing the RNA molecules that were present in their brain. These are called the transcriptomes. And we compared the transcriptomes from the disease mice against the transcriptomes from their normal mice to be able to see which genes changed in the disease process. And to our horror, we found that almost 7,400 genes changed. And it turns out most of those are biological noise, and we develop really beautiful ways for subtracting that biological noise away. And we ended up with a conclusion only about 300 genes really dictated this neurodegenerative process. At the same time, we looked histologically at the brains of the animal across this 22-week period. And what we found was that there were four major processes that were involved in this disease. Something called prion replication and accumulation, uh, glial uh, uh, activation, and then uh, two forms of neurodegeneration. There were biological networks, at least partial networks, that represented each of these four systems, and we could map beautifully the 200 of the 300 genes into these four major systems, and the other 100 actually identified six smaller processes that had smaller networks. And the 10 networks together, and looking at their dynamics across time, explain virtually every aspect of the pathophysiology of this disease. But the really important take-home lesson was that the networks became disease-perturbed in a sequential manner, starting first with prion replication and accumulation, and then glial activation, and then the two forms of neurodegeneration. The reason this is important is in studying human disease, it's essential to know what the very first event is in the transition from wellness to disease. Understanding at that time point the disease perturbed networks gives us the possibility of early diagnosis and eventually of being able to re reverse the disease at the earliest stage. And the reason this is very important is that we're going to talk later about how we can now do for the first time exactly the same kind of studies in humans. But there is one more important point, and that is, in order to know where you are in this neurodegenerative process, we had to actually sample and, in doing so, killed the individual mice at different stages of this disease process. And if we're going to do it for humans, we can't do that. So what we decided was to test the proposition that these disease-perturbed networks would actually create changes in proteins in the blood that could reflect this disease initiation and progression process. So what we did was to develop a series of techniques, which I won't describe, that allowed us to identify in humans 100 proteins in the blood that are relatively brain-specific. They map back to many of the major networks we know about in the brain. And of course, in a normal individual, <coughs> excuse me, those 100 uh, proteins will have one set of levels. But if any one of those networks becomes disease perturbed, that alters the level of its cognate proteins and that'll be reflected by changes in concentration in the blood so we can distinguish uh, healthy brains from disease brains. And because each different disease perturbs different combinations of networks, we can distinguish what type of disease it is. We found that there were uh, a number of these brain-specific proteins that map to the four major networks in the mouse. And we were actually able to use mass spectrometry measuring the concentration of these 
15 proteins that mapped into each of the four major networks to show that they too, as with the transcripts, were successively disease perturbed in precisely the same order and they only differed by a few days from the initial events that we were able to prick out in the brain. So it means we've made the blood a window into distinguishing wellness from disease and following the progression of disease. And we'll talk more about that later uh, with, uh, with humans. So by 2006 or so, we had uh, clearly defined systems medicine and P4 medicine. And in many ways, we were at an enormous point of opportunity, but we needed to develop the technologies and strategies to fundamentally change medicine. And we had many ideas. We put many grants into the National Institutes of Health, most of which failed because they asked that everything be half done before you do it. But we were very fortunate in 2000, I was very fortunate in 2007 to meet the Minister of the State of, uh, Minister of Finance of the State of Luxembourg, who was a dominant political leader at that time and had decided he was going to transform the economy of Luxembourg from a 90% dependence on financial services to bring in healthcare and uh, biotechnology. So he asked me, would I write a proposal that would help them do that? And we wrote a proposal where we built an institute that mimicked our own at the University of Luxembourg that's been enormously successful. And on the other hand, what they did for us was to give us uh, of the order of $100 million over a period of five years to develop the technologies and strategies of systems biology. And these enable us to take on daring high-risk projects and almost all of them ended up being successful and we'll uh, show you some examples of that in just a moment. But it put us at an enormously interesting tipping point because we could really do fascinating kinds of things now. And so in 2012, I made the proposal that the way to bring P4 medicine to the healthcare system was to engage 100,000 normal individuals and study their wellness and optimize their wellness using the technologies that we developed and so forth. And in 2014, we did the first 108 of these individuals, and I'll talk about that uh, in just a few moments. What uh, also happened, of course, was the next year Obama, President Obama proposed precision medicine and doing essentially exactly the same uh, dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds that we'd suggested for uh, scientific wellness. And of course, again, with the affiliation with the Providence Healthcare System and ISB, it made it possible to translate all of these ideas uh, directly to the bedside will tell you where we stand before. So here are some of the technologies that we developed in the course of the Luxembourg uh, Agreement. And uh, I'm not going to go through and talk about all these, but I'll talk about uh, two that I think are really important. One, third generation DNA sequencing is the ability to sequence single DNA molecules and to do the base detection electronically. And what this gives you is the possibility of very long reads of easy automation of the front end part of the DNA sequencing. And it's my guess in a five to eight year period, we'll have third generation sequencing and human genomes will cost less than $100 a piece rather than $1,500 a piece uh, today. A second area that ISB really pioneered is that of proteomics where we developed together with uh, our initial co-founder at ISB, Rudy Abersol, and later in collaboration with him, number one, uh, targeted proteomics, which lets us look at 100 proteins and very complex mixtures quantitatively. And I'll show you an example of that. And number two, we've developed, uh, helped develop a new 
uh, type of proteomics called swath proteomics that will let us be global and measure at one time quantitatively uh, 6,000 or more proteins from, uh, again, complex mixtures. Now, the strategies that we've developed uh, in many ways are even more powerful. And you can see uh, several examples of those listed there. And I'll, I'll just mention two. One, making blood a window into health and disease. And I'll show you a beautiful example of that in just a moment. And then two, these dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds, which I think will absolutely uh, transform medicine. So making blood a window into health and disease, I'll show you how we've attacked a problem in lung cancer and solved it by using a systems approach uh, to creating diagnostic biomarkers. So the essential problem is that in the US, there are 3, 000, 3 million nodules in the lung that are seen a year, and that poses for the pulmonary oncologist the question of what do you do with those nodules? Are they, are they uh, lung cancer? 600,000 of these go to surgery. These are costly surgeries. And more than half of those that go to surgery are done on benign nodules that increase morbidity and increase cost to the healthcare system. So our objective was to develop an assay that could distinguish a benign nodule from a cancerous nodule. And we approach this by uh, a systems approach to diagnostics. We started with uh, 400 proteins, roughly, and we did a whole series of filters that allowed us to go down to 13 that did quite a good job at distinguishing benign from neoplastic nodules. And we actually moved to two of those that did a superb job at doing this. So the two markers allowed us to identify more than 50% of the benign nodules at a 95% confidence. And what this obviously allowed us to do was to save the healthcare system roughly $4.5 billion a year just by ruling out uh, almost 40% uh, of the surgeries that were necessary. Of course, this improved the quality of life for people with lung cancer, knowing that your nodule was or was not uh, 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 neoplastic. And what was really interesting is after all of these filters, which I haven't described, that got us from 400 to 13 proteins, you can say, what exactly did those 13 proteins represent? And it was striking that 12 of the 13 mapped into one of three disease perturbed networks in small cell lung cancer. So the filtering system reflected the biological process of lung cancer uh, very, uh, very ably. And, and this is really an important slide that uh, I really want to push. Freeman Dyson is really a terrific writer. You ought to read him uh, if you ever get a chance. His point, new directions in science are launched by new tools and strategies much more often than by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways. The effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that need yet to be explained. And the Human Genome Project was absolutely a beautiful example of that. So by 2013 or so, we saw then a convergence of systems medicine with the new digital analytics for self-measurements with uh, big data and its analytics and with social networks. And these allowed us to articulate much more clearly just exactly what P4 medicine should be. And to show you how different P4 medicine is from contemporary medicine, let me stress the six major differences. So one is it's proactive rather than reactive. Two is it focuses on the individual and not on populations of individuals. Three, it's a major focus on scientific wellness as well as disease and not just on disease. And of course, four, it's all about creating these dense, dynamic, uh, personal data clouds that are so critical for wellness and, and uh, understanding disease. And then 
five, it throws enormous skeptical view on the classic way of doing drug trials, which is to take 20,000 individuals and give them a cancer drug or a placebo and extract from that population responses and deduce how well the drug is done. And of course, the fault of that is each of those 20,000 individuals is unique genetically and unique environmentally, and you have no business averaging them. In fact, what the averaging does is increase the signal-to-noise kind of ratio. So in P4 medicine, what we'll do is we'll have 20,000 individuals, each with their dense dynamic personal data clouds, and we'll stratify those individuals based on their own unique properties according to features you're interested in, response or failure to response to a drug and, and things like that. And to, to uh, stress this, I'm going to show you in just a moment how poorly the classic uh, system for drug discovery does. And finally, I'll just mention that social networks are going to be key in this new world, both for learning about P4 medicine for uh, uh, crowdsourcing and ultimately for advocacy for uh, changing the system. The healthcare system is every bit as conservative as the scientific system and resists every bit as vigorously uh, dramatic new changes and everything. Now, here's really a striking slide. These are the 10 most uh, sold drugs in the US and the orange individual indicates how many people respond to the drug in an appropriate population? So the numbers vary from 1 in 4 to 1 in 25. And that means almost all the people that get the drug are wasting the money and they're exposing themselves to the complexities of cross-reactivity and bad reactions to the drug. And this comes from doing population studies where you can't distinguish the orange people from anybody else. But with the P4 approach, we'll be able to pick the orange people out immediately and to assign the features that will in the future allow us to distinguish for a given drug who's orange and who isn't. And then you can give the drugs to uh, appropriate kind of people. So for P4 medicine, two major ideas, scientific wellness and uh, uh, understanding disease and so forth. And what I would say is, and I'll define what scientific wellness is in, in just a second, my own personal view is that scientific wellness will create a whole new thrust in the healthcare industry. And I think within 10 to 15 years, its market cap will far exceed that of the old fashioned disease industry or uh, current healthcare industry. And the really key lesson to take home at this point is exactly what these dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds can do. So one, we can interrogate each of you to identify the actionable possibilities that will allow you to optimize your wellness. And we'll show you an example, some examples of this in just a few moments. Number two, and this is really an important point, as we follow these people longitudinally with these dense dynamic personal data clouds, we'll begin to see wellness to disease transitions for every single common disease. We'll be able to identify the initial disease perturbed networks to develop the early diagnostics and ultimately the therapeutics that will allow you to reverse the disease before there's ever a phenotypic symptom of the disease. In a sense, this reversal will be the preventive medicine of the 21st century. We'll be able to diagnose the very earliest stage for most diseases and reverse it. And of course, these dense dynamic data clouds will let you study disease in a way we've never been able to study disease before. Looking at the uh, initial events, if you, can, if you can guess who is going to get the disease, but following progression, following the response to therapy, and hopefully following the response back to uh, nor normalcy and everything. And finally, I'll just say that in the future,
individual N of 1 experiments are utterly going to be the key to deciphering many of the complexities of medicine that we can't even touch today. And a classic area that I think will revolutionize is nutrition. And I think, frankly, nutrition is in the dark ages today. And for the first time, we have the tools to look at it uh, in very, very different ways. So why is scientific wellness so important? Well, one is chronic disease is really skyrocketing in our populations. Number two, we're aging. All of our populations are aging in striking ways. And to give you an example of that, you can do a calculation that says 50% of the children born in this calendar year will live to be 100. So the question is, what's the quality of their life for the last 30 or so years of living to be 100? And we want it to be uh, absolutely superb. And I think another striking fact, when uh, a recent study was done on the determinants of health, one was able to demonstrate that genetics contributed 30%, that the environment uh, and behavior contributed 60%, and the healthcare system only contributed 10%. And of course, the key thing about these dense, dynamic, personal data clouds is they are the only way that we can use to assess how your genetics are clashing with your environment at a given point in time. And that's why uh, they are so critical. So in 2014, I persuaded 108 of my friends to go through a year-long study with these dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds. 50% of them went into the study really skeptical. So remember that, uh, that uh, statistic. And what exactly are the measurements we made? First, we uh, examined the complete genome sequence, all the genetic variants for each individual. Then three times every, well, every three months, we took blood and saliva to do clinical chemistries, metabolites, and proteins, and we carefully selected those. And then again, every three months, we took stool samples so we could do the gut microbiome. The microbes that live in your gut have an enormous impact on your health. We're just beginning to learn about it, and this is going to be a great discovery study. And then finally, we've given our subjects uh, Fitbits so that we can record activity, quality of sleep, and uh, pulse rate, and other things like that. And basically, then what we did is every three months, we uh, took uh, the blood samples for analysis as described above here. And a really important point is, once a month, every individual was called by a coach who described for them the actionable possibilities both defining what that meant in simple terms and putting it in the context of their own healthcare objectives, which they'd learned uh, at the very beginning of the study. And these health coaches are absolutely critical for uh, integrating and analyzing these data, taking the actionable possibilities to the individual and persuading them to act on it. And in fact, the health coaches were responsible for more than 70% responses to actionable possibilities, really a much higher number than I ever suspected we would uh, be able to get. What was also remarkable was the data itself. And I can only give you the briefest of thumbnail sketches. But to make uh, an analogy, I think these dense, dynamic individual data clouds are exactly like the Hubble telescope. It, for the first time, allowed one to look at uh, the universe with a resolution never before achieved. And so these dense, dynamic, personal data clouds have allowed us to look into human biology, into human disease, in ways we could never imagine. And to give you one example, we were able to take individual data bits from each of the six data types and do several types of statistical analyses to show data bits in one type that correlated with data bits in the other type. And we found almost 5,000 of these correlations. These correlations give us new insights into biology. 
They tell us systems that are interlinked that we never knew were interlinked before. They give us new actionable possibilities. They've given us some really striking hints about good biomarkers and possible therapeutic targets. So there's enough small science in this chart uh, probably to put uh, a thousand people to work for years and years. So there are enormous opportunities represented here. Now the other thing we learned is from the genome sequence, we could for 60 or 70 GWAS diseases, these are genome-wide association study diseases, we could actually determine the genetic risk for the individual. And that's because these GWAS data were cast in terms of probability. So we could go through the entire genome and look at all the variants associated with the disease and add up their probabilities and translate that into potential genetic risk. And what we've been able to show with five different types of disease now is that the genetic risk increasing from left to right correlates beautifully with the disease phenotype in these patients. This is uh, LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and you can see a beautiful correlation from low risk to uh, very high risk. And we can do this for thousands of metabolites and proteins and so forth, and they give us all sorts of striking new diagnostic uh, and therapeutic kinds of correlations. Here are some of the diseases that we'll be able to do genetic risks for. And I'll talk later about Alzheimer's because we're going to do really interesting experiments with people that have a very high risk for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, another thing we could look at are transitions from well to greater wellness. And we use the metrics that changed in that transition to begin fashioning a metric for wellness. And we think we'll be able to develop metrics both for physiologic and sociologic wellness. We were also able to look at people that went from well to less well, and a few did. We were able to look at people that um, went from wellness to a disease transition. And again, learning that earliest transition and reversing it is the key to preventive medicine. And finally, we were able to follow the progression of disease, uh, the response to therapy, and ultimately, hopefully, the return to health and so forth. And uh, finally, we had 5% of the individuals had chronic diseases. And for a number of these, we were able to see uh, a reversal back to wellness. We had several with hemochromatosis where we had striking reversals once we uh, took, managed the disease phenotype uh, appropriately. But each of the individuals, when they did something actionable, could look at their chemistries and see things were improving. And this was an enormously positive reinforcing event. When we looked in the initial clinical studies at the individuals, 91% were nutritionally deficient, some in really serious ways. 68% uh, had infl inflammatory responses. They could either be diet or they could be infections. And we, we saw a lot of both and reversed a lot of those. We had 59% with cardiovascular complications and 56% with prediabetes. 53 out of 108 were prediabetic. We moved seven of those to normal, and we moved the other ones uh, over strikingly toward the uh, more uh, normal kind of stage. Um, and finally, uh, genetics. Uh, your genome tells you a lot about how to diet, how to exercise. There are 300-some variants that predict your susceptibility to various types of athletic injuries and so forth. We actually had uh, about four people that had mercury toxicity. Three of the four were due to eating excessive amounts of tuna sushi. When they went off that, the mercury reversed down to normal right away. And, and the fourth one was amalgam fillings that were replaced. And again, uh, it went down to normal. So you can see then that we had striking correlations. We could do genetic susceptibility, and that opens up lots of exciting things. 
And then we can look at these state transitions, which themselves uh, are uh, absolutely fascinating. So um, what exactly did uh, the, the pioneers think? 108 out of 108 thought it was the experience of a lifetime, and it really had changed it. And what was remarkable is everybody stayed on. We had no one dropping out. And so that, I think, is testimony to the power of what happened. But the first insight was most of them were excited because given data, you can actually make your own health determination. You didn't have to have a doctor telling you what to do. They were also excited because they came to understand your genetics don't determine your destiny, rather your potential. And there are a lot of ways to avoid many of the uh, genetic limitations most of us have. Not all, but most. And then finally, they were really struck with the fact that most people thinking themselves well, I think would have been in the bottom quarter of wellness and that with the actionable possibilities, they really elevated themselves with regard to uh, wellness and so forth. So at the end of 2014, we decided to set up a company called Aravail, whose mission was to bring scientific wellness uh, to uh, consumers. And it, it has been a spectacular success, almost without advertising. It's gotten 1,400 customers in the first nine months or so. This is in the Seattle area, and we're beginning now to bring this to California, and we'll move uh, to other states as well. And the business plan is really twofold. One is to uh, optimize consumer uh, wellness and help them avoid disease. And of course, the second is to create a longitudinal database that will itself transform the healthcare industry. And I'll say a word or two more about that in just a moment. Now, ISB and its affiliation with Providence that I spoke is really going to be very much focused on these dense dynamic data clouds and using them all the ways we've talked about. We are also really developing new assays that will bring the cost of the assays down because that's the limiting factor in scientific wellness. It's now about $5,000 per person per year, and that's way too much. But we're on a more law decline uh, on the assay costs and so forth. And my prediction is in a five-year period, it'll be 10% of what they are today and so forth. And we're also developing a lot of really striking new analytics for being able to deal with uh, all of these different types of data. So again, this affiliation I mentioned that, that occurred back in April ha has really transformed what ISB can hope to do. And our partner, uh, uh, Providence, is really a striking partner. So it's in seven states. It has 50 hospitals. It's got uh, of the order of 10,000 or so physicians. And it has access to more than 30 million electronic medical records. And we're developing now systems for beginning to mine the records uh, for all of the obvious things that one can begin to think about. So it represents a, an unusual opportunity to look at data that already exists. But even more, it has given us the opportunity to propose four pillar projects. And I'll describe uh, each of those very briefly. So the first is scientific wellness. Uh, there, Providence is going to take 2,000 of its employees and put it in the Aravail program for a three-year period and will compare it against 2,000 employees that are only given uh, normal wellness treatment. And this three-year study will do two important things, unequivocally demonstrate the power of uh, scientific wellness in transforming people's lives, but even equally important, it'll give us the economics for understanding just how much scientific wellness saves the healthcare system. And it's going to be, I'll guarantee you, a staggering sum of money. The second pillar that we're looking at is taking 200 patients newly diagnosed with breast cancer, putting them on the dense dynamic personalized data cloud regimen, 
and then following them through treatment to post-treatment and bringing them back to wellness as quickly as we possible can, with the wellness being defined in part by the initial studies before treatment and so forth. And this will be done again against a control group. And you can do this for any type of cancer, quite obviously. The uh, third area that we're really excited about is Alzheimer's. Uh, we're collaborating with Dale Bresident at UCLA, who's developed a 36-point regimen that looks in very preliminary studies like it can fantastically reverse the earliest stage of Alzheimer's, bringing people back to normal and maintaining them at normal as long as they stay on the regimen. So we think with appropriate experimental and controls, we'll be able to demonstrate the power of this regimen for reversing the early stages of Alzheimer's. And the second project we're going to do is take 200 individuals at very high genetic risk for Alzheimer's. And we'll start them on this program and demonstrate that they never transition over into Alzheimer's. So we think we can do both reversal and prevention. I'd be glad to talk uh, in more detail about how we're going to do that in any time. And then the fourth pillar is to study a disease now totally intractable, uh, glioblastoma. Usually people die within uh, 18 months or so. Uh, and we're going to really focus on, on two new kinds of opportunities. One is immunotherapy, and that's a real challenge to this tumor because it has a low mutational burden. And in general, tumors that have low mutational burden aren't good candidates for immunotherapy, but we have ways to, to think about it with new approaches. And number two, uh, even more exciting to me, is I think cancer is exactly like AIDS. It should be treated from day one with triple drug therapy. So glioblastoma is really nice because from the resected tumors in every case, we can get beautiful tumor stem cells that can be expanded. And we can use those in microtiter plates to scan for their susceptibility to drugs for the individual. And then later, their susceptibility to combinations of drugs for the individual, and that's the strategy that we're, we're going to be employing. So in closing, let me just talk about what I think the future of healthcare is going to be. One, P4 medicine has really come to healthcare. And two, precision medicine is going to be absolutely a central feature. These dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds will let us assess genetics uh, and the environment. Three, we'll be able to optimize wellness for individuals, as I discussed with you. And four, <coughs> we'll be able to use these individuals to get, for all common diseases, their earliest transitions and learn to reverse them, uh, a new type of uh, preventive disease and so forth. I think uh, what is also going to be true is that scientific wellness uh, needs to be a lifetime time journey. And uh, so let me make two points. Eric Topol has studied a group of 1,000 individuals at the Scripps Institute that are 90 years or older, never been sick a day in their life, never taken a drug. They're in their 90s, fully capable. He calls those the elderly. So that's point one. Point number two is I learned when we were studying 18 individuals, uh, 115 or older, uh, and we were looking for genetic variants that predisposed to aging, and the, the, the number was not large enough to draw any striking conclusions. But what I did learn is when you get to be 100, almost all people die very quickly from a complete systems failure. So my hope for scientific wellness is that if people ascribe to it for a lifetime, uh, carrying out all of the new emerging actionable possibilities, that we can elevate ordinary people to the status of the elderly, going into the 90s fully functional and capa uh, capacitated and everything. And of course, all we have to do is get you up to 100, 
and then you can deal with the total system's failure after that. So anyway, um, I think that uh, healthcare is uh, going to have its costs dramatically reduced by this uh, scientific wellness. I think we're going to create a new wellness industry. There'll be many companies that will use these dense dynamic data clouds pointed at certain diseases uh, to bring wellness to people before they get the disease and so forth. I think the data will transform how pharma, biotech, nutrition companies, and diagnostic companies practice their art. We can, for the first time, let them deal with signal-to-noise problems they didn't even know existed before. And of course, finally, my dream is in a 10-year period, we will use Moore's Law to bring the cost of scientific wellness to a place where we can take it to developing countries as well as underdeveloped countries and even begin to think about the democratization of healthcare, uh, a dream that was inconceivable even a few years ago. Lots of people do these things. I won't go through and mention any of the names, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>